Welcome everyone to the February System Thinking Ontario. Um, for those of you who are wondering what this topic is, it's, it's, this is actually intended to be a little bit of a loose conversation. Uh, we called it sense making and theory building. And uh, for people who have not yet caught this video on the Princess Bride, you keep using that word. I don't think you know what it means, <laughs> what you think it means. Um, I think part of this was generated um, in, in back channel chat that Gary gave me from January. Uh, when we're talking about uh, world hypotheses, which is actually kind of like world theories. Um, mm -hmm. you're, you're headed towards world theories. Uh, mm -hmm. But then it's like, well, you know, do you actually know what a theory is? And, and then also one of the other terms that came up was sense making. And mm -hmm. it's like, okay, do we really know what sense making is all about? And, uh, and in both of those topics, there's a, a lot of academic literature. And so we kind of want to discuss uh, the uh, scientific view of, um, uh, of, of what's behind this. And it, it impacts us in the system thinking world uh, quite a lot when we use language. And a lot of, uh, I claim that most people actually understand system thinking to some extent. It's a language that messes them up quite often. And so uh, we're using this as an opportunity. Uh, Gary will kick us off with some slides and, um, uh, but uh, Gary and I are not the only sources. Actually, uh, on the email after it went out, Peter Jones had sent a link to an article that he had published, um, and he referred to um, the articles, of, uh, some of the stuff of Brendan Durbin. Um, and so maybe if he comes on, he'll contribute to that. So it's a, a group sense-making activity, as we'll find out. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm going to stop the share, and we'll do our usual um, uh, ask people to uh, spend 15 seconds introducing, and uh, maybe the question today will be, um, okay, uh, what's your name, and have you seen the line from The Princess Bride? Uh, Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I didn't get it, and I moved on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay. Nishat, say hi. Hi, so I'm Nishat, and no, I, I, I just saw some YouTube about the Princess Bride. I didn't notice the line yet. <laughs> yeah, you have to catch up later. Mm. Terry, do you want to say hi? I should going to hide out. Mm. Hi, I'm, I'm Terry. I'm Gary's wife, and I'm glad to, to meet you all. <laughs> Oh, okay. And have you seen The Princess Bride? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Homework. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mark, would you would like to say hi? Yeah, hi. No, I, I think I've seen The Princess Bride, but I didn't see this piece, so I'm going to have to uh, catch up as you go along. Okay, thanks. Mm. Uh, Don? Uh, yes, I've seen The Princess Bride. I think I've seen the piece, um, but now I'm wondering if there's more to it than I might have missed. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Anna. Hello, my name is Anna Checkman. Uh, yes, I think I even remember that line from when I saw it first couple of times and I always thought it was funny. It's, it's got that sense of humor. Thanks. <laughs> Elena? Um, I actually have never seen The Princess Bride. Oh, more so, homework uh, for you. I'll have to catch up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And Zad, have you seen The Princess Bride? I haven't. Maybe, yeah, just I haven't seen it. I watched the clip. I didn't really get the reference fully, but uh, I guess I have homework to do as well. Homework to do. And uh, I think Dan, I didn't get Dan yet, right? Nope. And I have not seen The Princess Bride. I probably i uh, am delinquent like some of the other people here, I guess. So it should uh, be fun. <laughs> okay. It's not homework. <laughs> yes, right. I'm not going to do my homework, so I'm going to be really doing good. <laughs> so we, we had a little pre-discussion about, about this content, and um, I wanted to ask Zad to do a little preamble on the audiences that we have usually in System Thinking Ontario, because uh, with uh, a topic like sense-making, there are going to be people at various levels. Um, Zad, do you want to address that? Yeah, sure. I was just thinking that given... Um, Systems Thinking Ontario has a connection to OCAD University and a lot of the uh, SFI cohort. So 
Um, in terms of referencing that program, there is a course called Human Factors, at least when I took it, and Dr. Peter Jones, who may join the call, um, you know, shares, shares a little bit about an introductory level about sense making. Uh, and he has published some work on SMM, sense making methodology. Um, but essentially, you're getting at understanding how people have what we would call sense making re regimes. So the ways in which they come to understand the world, the way in which the, you can map and understand incidences and how things occur, um, group sense making. So how do you make sense of a, of a phenomenon together as well? Um, and then translating that into a design program, uh, Dr. Peter Jones also works with um, human tific, um, and you know they there's a term that uh, G.K. Van Patter uses. It's is um, we call making the strange familiar sense making and making the familiar strange strange making. And in a design world, that there's a, there's a little bit of a distinction play that happens. So you're making something that is familiar distinct. So the it's kind of a, a inversion of sense making by doing strange making. We talk about that relationship. But more recently, especially after in the early days of COVID, but I would say it was increasingly going in that direction. There's been a lot of communities outside of um, just the design world, but any communities around organization design and systems change and those elements, as well as psychology and philosophy that have started to pick up that term um, in sort of a meaning crisis way. So there's like a poly crisis response and there's a lot of organizations that were once in the world of um, teal organizations and, and responsive organizations, but they use that term uh, sense making, and a lot of it has gone into some of the philosophy about you know people's like John Verveke or Rebel News. No, not Rebel. Um, I forget the term. Rebel Wisdom. Rebel Wisdom uh, in the UK. So sense making in the pandemic days took on a new form or an elevated form. It just got a lot of uh, presence, um, and that was probably. Have, mm. has multiple kind of connotations packed inside it. So that was just my only commentary as a way to maybe orient ourselves as we go into the discussion. Okay. Thanks, Ad. So I'm gonna welcome uh, Gary Metcalf um, from Kentucky. And so System Thinking Ontario stretches south a lot these days and Gary's been joining us. And he's gonna start off with a, a slide deck to give us some grounding and then we'll just go into discussion. Gary. Sure. Thanks, David. Um, and thanks for the bridge um, to the topic, Zach, because I have not a thing to say about the Princess Bride. So, <laughs> uh, it's, uh, whoop, sorry, back to screen share. Uh, okay, is that up uh, visible? Yep, we're good. Yeah, yeah so um, there were a couple of pre-readings that I think had been sent out. One was kind of a, um, a summary of some work from Carl Weick, who did the book Sense Making, which I actually had read in my own doctoral work back in the late 1990s, published in 95, as I just was starting my PhD. And the second one was a, um, I, I guess, a small overview of um, case study research, which I won't get into specifically, um, but we can back into any of these things, um, you know, as they become relevant for the discussion. Um, the, the idea being, and, and the connection there is that as a faculty member in a university for the, well, different universities for about 20 years, one of the things that I ended up doing was teaching research to doctoral students. And that wasn't because I had a specialty in research. It was because my own frustration about the ways that research got taught, particularly to people who were studying organizations. And there tended to be, you know, this real strong bias that everything had to be essentially quantitative, um, if not actually experimental. And there was just a lot of that that absolutely made no sense for most of the kind of research that that management and organizational students were doing. So I kind of had to get forced into learning a lot more about qualitative methodologies, case research being one of those. And so it, it really kind of tied into how is it that you know? How do you understand things in a way that meets a rigorous standard, but that's still relevant to the kind of topic that you're dealing with? So that's where we're starting. 
How do you know? So let's just start with a little question like, how do you know what's real? Because in a lot of ways, that's kind of the essence of science, right? How do you actually know in a way that you can verify that leads to things like large theories, that leads to testable ideas? So we've got this idea that in order to really know, we've got this certainty of science, right? And all the things that go into what have been called the, you know, the scientific method, which isn't exactly a one uniform kind of process, but often it, inver it involves some, um, some variation of these steps of observation, experimentation, <clears throat> hypothesis building and validation and supporting of that, generalization, prediction, ultimately, if in fact the theory seems to hold well enough in the right kind of environments, But it's really not the whole story, right? So there are different ways of knowing in different kinds of domains of knowledge. So we've got the idea of measurement and testing in science. But if you get into a legal environment, it's really not the same process nor the same expectation about how you actually know. So in civil cases, at least in the US, the, the standard of evidence is a preponderance of the evidence, which is different than a criminal case, in which case there is an expectation that a jury would, in, in order to, con to convict, would find someone guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. So different standards of knowing based upon the kind of, even within a legal domain, the kind of differences of the cases. Academic publishing, of course, the gold standard has always been peer review. Journalism, in order to be trusted journalism, you know, you expect a journalist to have trusted sources or some kinds of evidence. Politics basically re relies on polling data still. Social media is like, we're in a whole new world. You know, you get likes, you get ratings, you get rankings. How do you really know? Well, you pop up on the first page of a Google search, right? That's how you know that something is important or how you know it has um, reached a certain threshold. The problem with every one of these is that they are not solid and beyond controversy in any one of these realms. You know, science is not perfect. In fact, there are all kinds of problems with scientific studies. And you know they be, that that whole problem of science has become more and more of a discussion over time. <clears throat> the courts, you know, one of the one of the big evidences, one of the big things in courts was eyewitness testimony. For I have no idea how long, eyewitness testimony is horrendously unpredictable. In terms of, you know, five people seeing the same event and you know, reporting exactly the same things that they all saw. It's it's terrible. That's not the way that people understand and can report. Journalism, you know, I mean, I think, yes, there are standards of journalism, but those have certainly changed over time, if not sincerely deteriorated. Politics, I mean, how many more bad polls can we get of elections before people say that's not working anymore? Social media, I don't know, take your best shot at this point. So <clears throat> David has um, blogged and probably has a lot more, you know, specific detail about some of these things and we can get into them, but it's not to go into the detail of this for this discussion. This is just simply to say that there are people who have absolutely thought through an awful lot of how we know. So this is originally from West Churchman. This is more of a description that uh, Ian Mitroff had used. There are ways of knowing, referencing certain kinds of inquiry systems, but each of them then has a different guarantor. You know, what? how is it that you know that you know this way? So sometimes we rely on experts. You know, you go to the, the highest level scientist and so we've got, you know, the um, the IPCC for climate change. 
huge panel of scientists that have you know, tried to bring together their work to try to talk about how much we actually know and how certainly we know about anything like climate change. With you know, a, a process of analysis, we count on logic as being a guiding force. You get to you know, this third way, this multiple realities, um, you know, beginning to touch on complexity. Well, or it, this, you know, it gets to more things like the polling. You can't just ask one person and get a representative view. So in the absence of that, what you want to do is get absolutely as many possible views as possible, as, as you can or as feasible, and then somehow bring those together into a collective. This idea of the dialectic of debate, meaning not just that you bring two sides, but actually that you are um, capable of taking a position and taking its antithesis and then starting to try to work from there to a larger understanding. And then this, you know, what, what I am called, um, you know, this unbounded systems thinking, the multiple perspectives or what Churchman called sweeping in. These are different ways to try to get to as certain, as much certainty as we can. So here's the, the summary of kind of the pieces from Wyke about sense making. So it's a process that's, you know, it's grounded in identity construction. This is critical, okay, because the sense of identity as being kind of a starting point, but a really essential piece. That's for a person, it's for an organization, it's for whatever you're talking about. The idea that systems actually have identities becomes relevant, that it's retrospective. You're you're using things that have happened in order to try to pull this together in a way that makes sense. Inactive of sensible environments, it's kind of tangled language that, you know, we'll get into some of those. So what does it mean but not a lot of detail on this either. It's social, meaning it's, you know, people connecting together. It is an ongoing process. It is not a, you know, define this, come up with a final answer and you're done. Focus on and buy extracted cues. We're looking for digging deeper plausibility rather than accuracy. This is a part actually of the ongoing thing. So, you know, where scientists really want to arrive at a final conclusion that leads to a predictable set of future outcomes. Most people in the world, we're wandering through days, right? And we're doing the best we can, and we're not working particularly from hard and fast theories. We're working from heuristics, right? We're doing the best we can to try to understand what's going on and using that as a way to keep moving forward and then keeping keep on making sense so that we try to make sure we don't lose our way. So I've taken not the theoretical kind of quotes from Mike, but a, a handful of statements that um, <clears throat> I think it, for me, to the essence of some of what he was, I, I think, trying to propose. So sense-making begins with a basic question. Is it still possible to take things for granted? So, point of discussion. When, when the world seems to be out of kilter and it forces you to start asking a question, so what's going on here? You're moving into, I think, by necessity, this process of sense making. So I'm curious, are there, are there things that have popped up for anyone here on the call recently that start questioning your own um, assumptions about the world? Well, I've always done that. <laughs> Please. Please, Nisha, go ahead. I'm sorry. I said I've always done that. Yeah. Okay. And so, you know, can can you give me a reason, for instance, about a something that has happened that kind of challenged the way you assume the world would be, and then, you know, either something, some somebody said something, uh, you know, public comment, a, a whatever, maybe an experience you had that you realized that other people might not see it that way. Um, I, I think I think a really good simple example would be 
maybe sometimes I just go. Um, I'm just walking down the street here in Toronto mm -hmm. and somebody just uh, smiles at me or flashes a smile at me, a totally random stranger. Yeah. And my, my first initial reaction would be just of surprise. Uh, like, why did they smile at me? Was that, was that something, you know, uh, are, they, are they trying to initiate a conversation? And I just stop and the person just keeps walking on. So I'm like, okay, maybe I just didn't understand anything. It, it, something that simple, it seems like a real curiosity, but it, so in the US, there is a stereotype that, you know, basically people who live in the South tend to be friendlier than people who live in more Northern parts of the US. Now, that's a huge stereotype, but there is a bit of an expectation that people in the South will acknowledge other people that they tend to walk by. And it probably comes from people growing up in kind of small towns where, you know, years, generations ago, maybe not, you know, certainly within my childhood memories, you would walk by people's houses and you would see them out in their yards or, you know, maybe in the front of their house or something. And, you know, uh, half the time you'd know them because it was a small town. But even if you didn't, you would smile, nod, acknowledge them in some way as opposed to walking through a big city where, you know, I, I lived um, during college in New York for a summer. And one of the things that struck me in the first probably week or so was how incredibly many worlds people could inhabit in the same space. You know, you, you would walk by a really expensive high-rise apartment building and a a woman might come out in a fur coat and get into a limousine walking by or around a homeless person on the sidewalk and other people, you know, milling around. And it appeared that none of them knew the others existed. Now, for a kid from the south of the U.S., you know, I just couldn't make sense of that. How could that be? But for them, with that many different people jammed so together in a small space, you know, it was it was a normal way of being. It was just completely foreign to me. So we've got a hand up, I think, from it's uh, it's Griffin. Griffin, okay. Yeah. Hey, Gary. Uh, hey. I got an example for you. Um, never have I seen such wide divergence in the ways that uh, people perceive the world and make sense of it and manage it uh, and have conflict about it as I have in uh, community gardens. I've been a part of a community garden for years. I'm on probably like my 15th growing season, participated in quite a few uh, different projects over the years. And uh, let me tell you, gardening is full of surprises as it is, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Tons of variability, slap in the face constantly about everything you thought you knew about the way the thing was going to go. But not only that, individual perceptions about what you might consider to be best practice or whatever vary extremely uh, to the point that um, I have, you know, neighbors in the garden who are so stressed about the amount of weeds in their garden that they're admitting to me the ridiculousness of going home and like eating junk food out of stress because they're so uh, like stressed out about their garden not doing as well as they wish it they wish it would. And the ideas that individuals have about the universality of their opinions, that these things are obvious, that we should all do this thing that I thought was, you know, I should pull the suckers off my tomatoes. This is like between uh, the leaves of tomatoes. Some people pull the suckers off. They believe it increases growth. I've tried that a number of times. I've done like little controls, one next to it. Sometimes a little bit, it makes a difference. But some people are religious about it. They'll tell you, you might. And if you don't do it, it's like disgust. You've committed a crime. <laughs> it's sacrilege. But then others, 
it's it's almost the opposite and it's so interesting to have these conversations about control and perception and abiding by whatever your adjacent neighbor is doing for the sake of you know social coherence so how's that for an example ever have a discussion about what a what a weed is oh yeah <laughs> i love the weeds i love them <laughs> yeah thank you thank you Griffin. i appreciate it anna so um i guess for me like sense making and like trying to find out what is going on like what's happening guys you know is like the pursuit of my life and i think it partly has to do with the kind of family that i grew up in um you know that this is going to be great because i'm going to start off like complaining about my mother but well here's an example I'm going <laughs> over to my mother's house and i'm feeling hot i'm like oh mom it's hot like let's open the window uh, let's open the window and she's like all the windows are open and i look around the room and the windows are not open just one window is open i say mom the windows are not open she goes again all the windows are open i said wait a minute you have one two three, four, five, six windows. Only one of them is open. You can't like stand here and tell me that all the windows are open. She's like, oh, well, I only only ever like open just this window and that window. And I thought the other one was open too. I'm like, yes, but it's not, <laughs> you know, so to her, right? Like she's got her own reality. Like she only opens these two windows. She doesn't touch the other ones. So she thought that the other window is open and she just anyway she didn't want me to open the window so it was easier for her to like I don't know question my reality when I say they're not open look <laughs> so um and this is how I grew up you know my mom we're not going to judge her too harshly she's an artist so she's she's got a particular um way of seeing things but yeah you know um sense making for me growing up was like survival so uh, I don't know exactly how it happens but it's you know I, I've got that skill um from you know <laughs> from the beginning of my life so Good. Um, that, yeah that's my uh, thank, that's thank you Anna yeah hang, hang on to this because there's a lot to build on so um Donald I'm going to go to you and and Dan um but yeah, if you'll if you'll keep the comments or questions kind of brief right now, and we'll move on, and we're going to keep wrapping back around. So go ahead. Um, you're on mute, Tom. All right, there we go. Yeah, the first one is um, I lived most of my life in fairly large cities, um, but uh, now I live in a village, <laughs> and uh, around here, uh, when you see people, you smile at them. You better smile at them. <laughs> They'll wonder what's wrong if you don't. Yes. <laughs> and they'll be very solicitous, and that's very nice. But you also appreciate that a lot of things that are, you know, handy and just around the corner when you're in downtown, you have to go quite a distance for. So it really helps if there's somebody around who can help you either do a workaround or, or lend you something. Or, and, and they're very open with this. They're very generous. They, but it, it's just a way of life. And um, I like it. It's much more relaxing. I don't have to worry about a lot of things. And while I may not be the most um, sociable person because of my background, I guess, but um, I still managed to, uh, to do fine. The thing I wanted to bring up quickly, very quickly, was this morning I heard a piece on the radio about early childhood memories. Mm -hmm. Are they reliable? And the number of opinions that exist out there and have gone through various stages of acceptance or rejection or modification is quite incredible. And I don't think they really came up with a proper answer. And uh, yeah, I, I think it's one of those things that we think we know a lot about, but because we have our own, right? Mm -hmm. Do we? <laughs> Do we really know? Yeah. So our frames of reference do shift over time, you know, along with what we believe yep. are pretty firm assumptions. Yep. So thank you. Dan? Yeah, I um, had an experience the other day that kind of shocked me. I, I opened the door for a young lady and she looked at me and then she said, I made her day. And I thought to myself, wow, I mean, it's good that I made her day, but, you know, we used to do that sort of more regularly, but never had that impact of making somebody's day. So there you have it. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah, those those assumptions that you just can't imagine other people don't see. Thanks, Dan. Next, sort of a, a way of approaching it. So sense making is a process in which individuals develop cognitive maps of their environments. Now, obviously, this has a lot of relationship with even the previous one. So our, our sets of assumptions by which we function. But this really gets to um, a, a different and somewhat deeper concept, I think, about mental maps or um, I've seen this and I, I was actually surprised the number of people, even, you know, early computer scientist people who were actually looking at things like internal maps of the models they built in order to function relative to their environments. The idea that even some of the most primitive organisms have some idea of some sense of their environments. That's what it amounts to. Um, there was actually a, a psychotherapist who sort of reinterpreted some of Freud's work to say that, you know, where his concept of energy coming from the id um, had some, you know, some validity for some people, but this was John Bowlby had actually looked at some of the, the work of working with people and said, really, more what's going on is people are building these kind of internal guidance systems. So it's almost, um, if, if you would, thinking of people building kind of their internal GPS, but it continues to get updated. And it's just another way to think about sort of those frames of reference by which we continue to work and move and try to understand the world. So this extends it a, maybe a step further. People create their environments as those environments create them. That it is an iterative process that we exert agency on the world and then also equally are shaped by those worlds, those environments that we inhabit. Now, in some ways it's probably self-evident, but I don't know that we have the awareness of that going on in the same way as when we pause to think about just exactly how we affect and are affected by in a very dynamic way the the spheres in which we live so any thoughts examples questions i think anna just put something in the chat that i don't know anna you can speak to you can speak to that yeah so anna yeah if you'll oh, unmute, yeah. go ahead uh, this is actually exactly what i'm uh, working on for one of my classes uh, i'm in um, MA design research. Uh, so um, at the moment, my project is based on two quotes. Uh, one is by um, Emerson, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Um, every nation and every man instantly surround themselves with a material apparatus, which exactly corresponds to their moral state or their state of thought. Um, that's uh, from 1904 um, uh, by Ralph Waldo Emerson. And uh, the second, quote is the one I put in the chat, we design our world and our world designs us back. And uh, Professor Bunch, if you know him, said, it's a feedback loop. So um, yeah, so what I'm trying to find out is in a given situation, and I have a situation that I'm working with, in a given situation, what kind of a feedback loop is it? Like, is it a, like a, you know, a, a balancing loop or like a, a reinforcing loop? And is it in line with the system goals? So um, that's, yeah, that's uh, kind of related to what I'm doing. Anna, can I just clarify? In the in the chat, it says word, and so I'm. I, I think I heard world. you say world. And yeah, so I it, just want to make sure. Yes, yes. Sorry, I, typo. Um, yeah, we design the world. Yeah, we design our world, and our world designs us back. Okay, thanks. Look like. <laughs> yeah, so it it is interesting when you get to. Um, you know, thinking about formal ways of describing things like feedback loops, causal feedback loops, um, you know, positive, negative <clears throat> balancing loops, you know, which are negative feedback loops, but they actually create, you know, a function. 
But then there's also just simply the experience, which I don't know how much awareness we actually have on a pretty regular basis of our impacting our worlds and them helping shape us. And uh, I guess, you know, maybe sometimes it feels like us pushing against the world and it pushing back against us. That certainly can be one way to, to experience that. But I think it's also the, you know, the other ways in which we simply engage with the world and then are shaped by in some reciprocal way. So, Dad? Yeah, the, I was just reflecting on what you were sharing uh, and thinking about it from a historical standpoint, because I'm just really nerdy about history these days. And I was thinking about different civilizational buildings and taking the civilizational unit of analysis. And, you know, some of the theories out there, you know, for example, if you take uh, ancient Egypt, for example, the um, the the rhythm, the the predictability of the flooding of the Nile and what it provides and what it allows for calculation and what calculation allows for building literally those types of nutrients in the body and what that strength gives you ultimately like accumulates in being able to build the certain structures and make sense of the world the way they do. That's one way of analyzing it. And so while I do kind of relate to this quote often in the design or architecture format, it is interesting to think about it in and from a sense making at a civilizational level. And I thought that's just to be a curious way to think about civil, uh, sense making at that at that unit. Thank you. Yeah, when you think about, you know, environments, you know, literally as the, the physical, <clears throat> natural kind of environment in which people live, and things like, you know, early agricultural settings where people, you know, they needed to have some awareness, some sensibility about seasons and about the annual changes, you know. So, yeah, if you lived in a place where monsoons were a huge part of the the actual moisture that came, you know, if your monsoon season was not regular in some way, it absolutely affected, you know, not just a few days, it affected the food supply for that group of people probably for the year. And so trying to figure out how to, um, you know, understand, predict, anticipate the regularity of seasons but then how do you explain when it is off? You know, we had a bad year um, because God didn't like us or because, you know, <clears throat> we didn't do well or, you know, we should have somehow, you know, created a sacrifice that would have somehow appeased some entity that, you know, we think had an effect on it. How do you understand these, you know, the regularities and the irregularities. Yeah, Anna. Sorry, this is also interesting. <laughs> Sorry. Um, well, this reminds me of like how um, chaos theory was, um, right. I don't know, discovered or uh, what uh, articulated. You know, they they they're plugging these formulas into these computers, and they're expecting to see something, but then they start seeing irregularities. So uh, some people give up and they say, "Okay, calculator error, computer error," and some people keep you know pushing the data and pushing the data, and until they see like chaos and like I don't know the Mandelbrot set or something like that. So uh, you know maybe if we see some. Yeah, we're looking for patterns, but maybe if we see like an irregularity, maybe it's just also a pattern, but it's just too big for our own scale to like understand something like that. Sometimes it takes a lot of looking at pretty big levels to find the patterns of regularity that are, you know, not the small regular predictable things. <clears throat> so this gets back to a more you know, a, maybe a more human, regular kind of concept that um, may take us in a little different direction. The more advanced the technology is thought to be, the more likely people are to discredit anything that does, does not come through it. I don't know that this is a truism. I think it's an interesting proposition. But if you think about this relative to advances in science, it probably has some, some validity. 
if you think about it in the social sphere, and I don't have the latest numbers about you know where people mostly get their information. I personally found it rather disturbing that TikTok has become the, I think, the number one or one of the top search places for people looking for information now. But how true it is, I'm not sure. So, Donald? Okay, I'm gonna say, <clears throat> I think this depends on the phase uh, of the new technology, if I can put it that way. In the beginning, I think people regard new technology as magic. The, the wonderful thing that is going to change everything. And they soon discover that it does change everything, but not always in the way they had hoped for or expected. So their attitudes may change and they may want to discredit the technology and, uh, and, and go back to an earlier form or a different form or take a, a, an absolutely off the wall approach. And I think that may be the phase we're entering into now with a lot of the um, online applications. Yeah, I, I think it's an interesting generality and I think it's one to be questioned um, because maybe we do learn only enough to learn to question things. David? Um, when I was at IBM, we're doing a lot of work around mediation um, and uh, you don't think about how much uh, is mediated. Uh, like we're having a discussion now, traditionally system thinking Ontario was we would actually physically be in a circle and what the dynamics do. Uh, but now we're all online and it's kind of like, you could ask the question following this quote, where any of the system thinking Ontario meetings were a meeting in person actually real, as opposed to this one that's recorded and people can now refer to it. So I, I can see the point here that when you're talking about advanced technologies and mediation, people get used to that idea. And then you could get down to the question of, is it worth it to travel anymore because you can see everything on YouTube? Well, and, and to take an extension, I guess, of the mediation and, and steer me if I'm getting you know too far afield here, David, but if you think about just the contrast of, you know, so we're gonna get together a group of friends and we're gonna ask them their opinions about a topic. By contrast, we're gonna do a Google search which is going to be assumed to be more accurate. Because there is, I think, a bias towards technologies in some ways, but that is also topic and you know, context dependent, I would assume. So Peter, and welcome, by the way. Oh, yeah, hi. Yeah, I was, uh, I was in a, another call that was hard to leave, uh, Eve Engler's um, the Canadian foreign policy call, which is which is every Monday, and I sometimes make that. It's a, a lot of, and and there's a lot of sense making going on about you know, uh, Canadian and North American foreign policy and anti-war and all that. Uh, but I, I there are a few things I wanted to tie together, and one, and I'll try to do that succinctly. I mean, so when we look at this quote, to think about Carl White's work, so much of it was oriented towards either organizational sense-making or how people normally follow mental models within the organization and don't break out of those mental models, which would be like this as well. So when a technology structures how work is done, people tend to rely on that. And, and actually, Wyke and Gary Klein and others think of sense-making as an alternative way of breaking through mental models. It isn't how we normally make sense of things. It's how we make sense of things when they break or when there's a critical risk. And mm -hmm. so we can, and so we, um, so the, the normal uh, force of our understanding of, of things that is, you know, not sense-making, but the, the, the mental models that were thrown to, you know, behave within, would be going along the lines of, you know, of, of this, but the, you know, but in terms of, um, actually this would be in terms of the, the, the question that Anna had before about whether it's, you know, we're looking at, you know, what type of feedback loop there is. Mm -hmm. um, I, 
I see this, I see the approach that Wyke and, and Klein might have as being more feed forward even than feedback because it's an anticipatory sense making to try to understand what can happen in this type of situation, especially in high risk situations, being able to anticipate and simulate and to make sense of what what might happen in these situations. And, and so that would be really at odds with the default view of things. It's at odds with, you know, it's at odds with, uh, to make sense of a possible, um, you know, possible anticipation of what could go wrong is the power of, of, of effective sense making, you know, like in the man and White's work in the Man Gulch disaster, where, you know, one firefighter survives because he used principles instead of relying on, he used his own understanding of kind of the dynamics of the fire and went into it instead of trying to outrun it. Um, you know, so 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 many of the, the actions that we take that get us into trouble, and this gets into foreign policy as well, we follow the defaults, we follow the mental models that we're, that we believe uh, people have a consensus in, and the consensus is normally wrong. Good, thank you, Peter. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so the anticipatory part of sense making, I think, has to involve questioning the models that seem to be so certain. So you know, we get new evidence. We see you know a, a something that has happened. And one way to approach it is simply to say, okay, well, that has to fit into the model someplace, even if it doesn't seem to fit. The other is to question the model itself and say, hmm, maybe it wasn't quite as clear as what we assumed, and maybe it's a good thing to question and see if we can make different sense of that. So, Dan? Dan? Yeah, this question has uh, provoked a lot of thoughts in my head, and I do believe there's a demographic sort of flavor to this. Um, but I'll go to the easy one first, and that is GPSs, advanced technology. Hey, I would argue sometimes I don't go where it tells me to go. And we've seen incidents where that's happened, where it, it leads you to a place that you don't understand why that algorithm did that. And it's caused some really severe um, you know, consequences. Now, if we look at the AI question, that's the one that's the most interesting one, because the AIs have now become much more sophisticated than ever before, much more data access to it. And of course, with you know David Dahl's work he's done recently on data sciences, he could probably give us a perspective on that. But I will tell you or suggest to you that uh, that that data building gathering process is highly biased, and we've started to trust it without questioning, it, unfortunately, you know and the uh, the interesting part, I, I talked to a colleague and I said, this AI stuff, can it actually be human? He said, well, you got to be careful about that because in the example is chat GPT, I think they call it. Mm -hmm. That, that uh, machine is based on data that was acquired in about 2020. So you go back and say, oh, so the truths that it's pr proposing are based on data in the 2020 timeframe. So it's, it's a very interesting paradox, this quote. It's a very powerful quote, actually, Gary. I, I really love this quote because, as I said, there's many ways to view this. Now, the simple one I'll leave you folks with is, if I walk up to a colleague of mine and say, okay, I can calculate that sum or whatever, this mathematical calculation faster than you can enter it into your little calculator, or whatever you're gonna enter. They'll look at me kind of strange after, for a while. Really, you can beat the computer in terms of speed? Well, I don't know, sometimes. I'll leave it to the rest of you people to share this. <laughs> yeah, so curiosity about chat GPT, I was trying to to understand just a little bit about um, what that was when I started seeing all the, the headlines about it. And, and, the, um, the, it, and if I got this right, one of the things about these machine learning, um, the, or the, I'm sorry, the, well, the machine learning, but the large language models, it's not like this somehow surveys the entire internet. They actually work from fixed data sets, I think. Now, I'm not positive about that. But for me, the importance is the question. Do we know what 
the data set is that is its source of what we would call knowledge. And if we don't, then we really are missing a big piece about knowing whether to trust it. I think that's a great question, Gary. And in fact, the same colleague who told me that the data is based on, you know, time and history, he also said it's English based. In other words, if you spoke, say, Dutch, it wouldn't have captured that probably because whatever reason, the Dutch people aren't publishing that much data that these things are, these robots are going around and picking up or some other language, maybe yeah. Chinese. I don't know. They're not going around picking that data up because yeah. the guys who wrote it aren't doing that. Yeah. So I, it's, I, it reminds us that, uh, you know, these computers, as it were, this technology stuff isn't always to be believed. The, the questions continue to be important. Yes, that's right. Absolutely. That's Please exactly have... it. That's exactly it. the questions tend to be. Yes, absolutely. That's what we should come out of this with. <laughs> <laughs> so, Nishat? Yeah, yeah, I have a question. Uh for you, Gary, that kind of segues off of what Peter Jones was talking okay. earlier. Uh, so earlier in the slide, you asked, uh, how do we know that what we know is really real? Like, how do we actually know it is real? So most of the time when we have a worldview or we are trying to make sense out of the world, we are just using cognitive maps. We are, we are basing our cognitive maps on what we have in our memory, memories of the past. It's really based on, you know, whatever experiences and memories we have of the past and our experiences. And we know those are pretty limited and the human memory is not very reliable. You know, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, it's a very unreliable source of data. And, and you know, even our cognitive maps, they're, they're kind of like the maps we have you know, geographical maps. It's it's kind of like a two-dimensional Cartesian projection. It's not, you know, really what a country or a landmass really looks like on a global earth. Mm -hmm. So how can we really trust our cognitive maps? I mean, even if we do modify them, even if we use different um, methods of inquiry and try to modify them and try to make them more accurate to the real world, can we, I mean, the bottom line is, can we really trust our cognitive maps at all? Well, and I think we, my guess is the answer is um, yes and no, Nishad. One, we have to trust our cognitive maps on a daily practical basis because otherwise we just get stuck, right? I mean, we just, we kind of go nowhere and we get frozen in time. But the other one is, if you assume that that is reality all the time, you're probably going to end up in a dangerous place at some point. So it is, I think, this iterative environment, iterative process, where we continue to use what we know and act in a way that we continue to learn from it to continue to modify what we think we know. Um, but to some degree, we have to rely on just the, the practical basis of what we believe we know, just in a simple, practical, functional way. So it's it's both, I believe. Well, you might also consider the role of uh, expertise and intuition here, which is where Gary Klein's view of sense-making is, is, is perhaps different from Wyke's in that the way uh, Gary Klein addresses that issue and in his mode of sense making is that um expert reasoning actually questions itself so it isn't so experts aren't concerned about what's real but about what is effective and because they have a wide variety of of uh, experience they have a broad um uh, range of experience in the developing of an expertise whether they're medical professionals or or strategists or uh you know um uh, you know, there are there. He's done a lot of work in the military and acute health care surgeons and, and and as well as firefighters. And so in these critical frontline activities where decision making must be done quickly and with high level of expertise, the mental models and sense making of situations is 
you know, is constant, at, especially in an emergency situation, and it has to be done well and at the first time. So effectiveness is more important than even, um, you know, that is you can't question so much um, how you know it's true, or you don't have the luxury of, of that inquiry. You have, if you're an expert, you've developed a repertoire of many such situations. And if you something is novel, um, you know, what, what they do and what he, in his, in his uh, work around naturalistic decision-making is that experts will, you know, in seeing a completely new type of situation will of course rely on, on similar things, which is what expert intuition is as opposed to naive intuition is that they have, you know, a broad range of experience, a deep repertoire of knowledge, and a lot of it's tacit. So they may not even have specific memories of exactly the situations, but have lots of different patterns that can come together to, to quickly size up the best action. So it's this taking action as a response to the arrangement of situations in an environment that makes um like and inclined sense making a matter of, of of like effective behavior and and it's it goes way beyond what we might think of as like even mental models where yes there's mental models about the environment but um in klein's version of uh, klein's writings about sense making he has this constant update of a working frame which is like a, a dynamic mental model about the situation but not about what you know, you know, as as like um, declarative knowledge or you know what you might have been taught. But it's it's about a dynamic frame that can that can be critiqued in the line of of duty or in the line of action, and then a new frame can result from that. So that can lead to much more effective behavior responses, like um, for example, uh, Captain Sullenberger's uh, landing of. Of the, of the 737 in the Hudson River, um, you know, during, a, you know, 10 years ago yeah. or so. And, they, yeah. you know, and so that was a good sense making. That was a, a, a classic kind of sense making situation of being able to reframe what was possible using expert knowledge about things, but taking action at the same time. Yeah. So what I'd say, Peter, is just for a moment, put, we'll put a pin in a distinction between expertise and a sense of truth. And maybe, Nisha, that's, you know, a sense of truth for oneself as opposed to a deep sense of expertise for real useful um, applications may not be the same thing. But we'll we'll come back. So, Donald, I'm sorry, do you go by Don or Donald? Uh, Don, usually. <laughs> okay, got it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think a lot... This all this stuff is contextual, right? Yes. Uh, that that we have to be aware of. And when you're dealing with a level of abstractions, well, for example, here's an absurd notion: um, if you were in an emergency situation and you had to act very quickly and very effectively and uh, as accurately as possible as the situation demands, if you went through all that process of reforming your mental models and uh, bringing them up and into the play, you'd be dead. <laughs> Or somebody else would be, you know. These things are are really uh, embodied, if I can put it that way. They're, um, they're also a good part of your brain as well. One of the problems with uh, with teaching, for example, and teaching is has really gone astray in the last uh, few decades, is that um, the experts come in and they say, "Well, and this is how it works, and this is how it works," and they say, everybody says, "Yeah, yeah, that's right," and then they suddenly make a big leap which is perfectly sensible to them because they really know the subject, but nobody else out there has a clue. And everybody's lost and they're panicky and they don't dare ask a question because they don't want to be stupid and they go back to the book and they go back to all kinds of sources. And a bunch of them finally figure it out and a bunch of them don't. Very inefficient, very bad in so many ways because of what it does to the people who come out on the wrong side of the, of the equation. But it's normal. And, you know, if you ever talk to somebody who is, a, say, a, a tradesperson who really knows how to do all kinds of 
actions and functions and especially a handy person, right? Um, they have a very hard time explaining this to anybody else or getting them to hit the nail the right way. And, and you know, from, from the very basics all the way through. So that's part of it. The other thing I just want to mention briefly is to go back to McLuhan of all people who said any brand new technology all but destroys the society hits if it's big enough, broad enough and effective enough. And that's the kind of situation we're entering now which throws everything else right off the table. Well, it certainly demands a whole new level of sense making. Yeah. See where we collectively are within those places. So mm -hmm. let's shift again a little bit. Um, so we've talked about sense making in a number of different applications and realms, but this is one that um, I, I think it's it's a big part of it. So how do you know who you can trust? You know, and so the point of this is what kind of information or what kind of data sensibilities, feedback, what do you use to know who you can trust? And is that a fixed or a dynamic state? Are you asking us, Gary? I am. That's not rhetorical. So, David. <laughs> okay. Oh, mute. David, sorry. Hey, so, a part, part, part of um, of what was involved with last month's world hypotheses, world theories, um, was that uh, when you say, "How do you know who you can trust?" Um, Stephen Pepper was actually fighting against logical empiricism, which says only if you can get direct data can you trust that. Mm -hmm. um, and he had this idea of what he called danda, which is all the stuff that is not data that you use to make sense of the world. And so the example would be, okay, so uh, if someone sees this like a machine, then you fill in all these things. Oh, it's like a machine. So um, uh, I went to the emergency room, you know, they have the processes there, you just follow the processes, and it's kind of like, that's very mechanistic sort of thing. Um, if, if, you, if you came in and said, oh, no, they should be more uh, organicist, they should be more holistic, and you kind of go, well, actually, in that case, I actually like the machine, it's predictable. <laughs> I don't necessarily want the stuff that happens. So there's a lot of stuff that gets filled in. So it's not only who can you trust, you come down to can you trust yourself? because you bring your own mental models in on top of uh, the data you see. Well, and so even that part of the trusting, I mean, it, it is a reciprocal process. So, you know, I can trust other people to some degree, but I also have to be able to trust my judgment about other people in order to maintain some sense of trust and even to know when to question that. You know, I, I can't just absolutely implicitly trust another person and know that there, you know, there is no questioning, no possible other alternative. You know, my trusting somebody else requires that I maintain an ongoing um, relationship. Hi. Why, Kelly? Yeah, that's fine. I didn't know I was on, I was on mute. <laughs> well, so so say more. Say more about um, how you perceive a sense of trust. I think I. I'm not, I'm I'm not sure. Uh, I I think that there's a lot of inputs uh, as far as making that quick snap judgment about the person coming towards you is he friend foe or um elena's word fuck uh so, so i mean just putting people into those three categories that there's a whole bunch of inputs uh including what what somebody's wearing or, or that perceptive kind of piece uh going back to the the piece on trust 
I think I would generally give a person a trust until they have validated it. And then I might not trust them, but they can do a change. And uh, then I will trust them again. It, like you said, it was, it's, it's a dynamic phase. I don't, I don't think that it's fixed or dynamic. Sorry. So, I'd like to remodel. So sometimes trust is a gift, right? I, I will choose to trust you until or unless the trust is violated, right? But if I don't continue to test it, then I don't really have a gauge by which to know that the trust is solid and continues. I, I kind of have to monitor it, right? Now, there are other ways to approach it that I don't really trust anybody, but over enough time, I find enough consistency of goodwill or honesty or whatever that it tells me that I don't have to somehow distrust that person. But for most of the people in the world, simply because there are so many of them, we tend to you know, gift that amount of trust within a certain realm. So you, know, you get to strangers on a street in a city. You know, I don't think you know you can trust them, but based upon your own internal model, you do have some sense about those who might be a threat as compared to those who probably would not be. For a lot of people, people who are more similar to them probably appear to be less of a threat, unless you know that you know those kind of people happen to be. Um, but those all do revolve around our our assumptions and our history, and you know our experiences with people of different kinds. And so you know it is, I think, this ongoing you know belief, experience, sensibility, testing that continues to refine those kind of internal models which are a different way of, of sense-making. I guess maybe that's what I would propose about this. Well, let's move on to one that's, I'm sorry, Anna, did you have a comment or a question before we move? Oh, uh, yes. So um, if um, what Gary just said came up in our, um, like, any any critical like design theory or any critical theory uh, class, the um, avalanche of comments that you would get is that this is basically the you know uh, the foundation of like any kind of misogyny or you know any kind of like discrimination you know personal biases um, influencing our perception of who we can trust based on uh, personal experiences and that influencing. Uh, you know, innocent lives of uh, people who actually have nothing to do with their biases and experiences. So, um, yeah, just uh, uh, I, I already know that my classmates would would uh, answer that, uh, uh, would address that. You know. So let's move to one that's uh, a little deeper. How how do you know that you're okay? How do you know that you're all right, good, but however you evaluate that. I mean, how, how is it that you evaluate your own sense of being? Zad? I'll try to give it a go. I'll be the, I'll be the brave one to go, but um, um there, you know, typically you might uh, think about it as well, relating to some of the other topics we talk about in systems changes about uh, rhythm, how you're feeling rhythmically. So uh, are you in a routine? Are you consistent with where the um, vibe or energy is of that day? You know, are you feeling um, if there's if there's a heavy demanding meeting day, are you up for the challenge or is it or is it a low quieter day? So if you're in sync or if I'm in sync, I guess you could say I start to feel like I'm doing okay. If I'm out of sync and something like feels like it's it's contrasting a little too strongly, maybe even taking a design approach, which is like the contrast is too heavy, um, then then I might feel like I'm not okay. So, but 
side, uh, you know, side perspective outside of my own body. That's just one perspective. <laughs> I, I, there are other ways to probably self-assess how I'm okay. You could even take a Descartian uh, view of if I'm, if I'm, if I wake up, I'm okay, you know, type of thing or, or whatever. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll throw that aspect up. Uh, the first one about uh, being in rhythm and being in sync um, is an indicator of feeling okay. Okay, good. Thank you. Elena? I would say it would be interesting to make a distinction between what they used to talk about as satisfying variables and hygiene variables. Okay. And you had hygiene variables. That meant nothing was wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, nothing hurt. There weren't any real um, problems cropping up. But then the satisfying variables were different. It was, are things good enough? Is all right enough? Um, and that kind of thing. And I think that's where people have their own uh, set of uh, parameters that go up and down depending on their circumstances. Um, you know, if somebody is uh, coming out of a very bad situation, um, okay could mean simply safe. Uh, for those of us who presume our safety, okay would involve other things. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Nishat? Yeah, th this is an easy question, Gary. This is real easy. <laughs> okay. I went to two psychiatrists at uh, Rikers Island and NYU okay. in New York, and they certified I'm okay. I'm totally okay. I'm not broken. I have no personality disorders. And that's absolutely one kind of a test for an awful lot of people. You know, I got a checkup and they didn't find anything wrong. So must be doing fine. You know, which is a, maybe a bit of a contrast to the, I have to check my social media feed at least five times an hour to see if I got enough likes to know that I'm okay. Different perspective. Kelly? Hey, wait, I, I think that Nishad's above me. No, I'm done. Sorry, I'm lowering okay. my hand. I, I wanted to ask this question because I, it was asked of me the other day. Uh, whether I was okay. And I thought I'm okay, but I'm actually upset uh, for community or the state of the world or something that that is beyond me, that that was, you know, that, that there's a multiplicity as well that I don't know if, we're, if, if we will address, but I found it was an interesting uh, situation where somebody is wondering uh, if I'm okay. I thought I'm fine, I'm safe, I'm warm, you know, all, all of those, uh, what did Elena call them, hygiene variables? Mm -hmm. And maybe maybe Elena answered it as well in terms of satisfied. Am I satisfied about the state of, let's say, women or, or, or something that would be really broad? Elena, would that be a satisfying that I was not okay about that? Yeah, I think it depends on where you want to draw those boundaries. Okay, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah, we'll, we'll keep wrapping her back around. So, Dan? Oops, let me just get this. Okay. Yeah, so, you know, this whole question of are you okay or not, I mean, it's a, it's a good one because, you know, um, how should I say this? If, quote, if, okay, let's say I meet somebody for dinner, uh, it's kind of important to me that they're kind of having fun with it. Like, you know, we're having fun together. So in that, in that scenario, I would suggest to you that, you know, I would have to feel that the other person's enjoying themselves. So that would be sort of me kind of looking at them, you know, all the sense making stuff I'm doing and, and, you know, and that's, that has to be part of the thing. Right. So in other words, in a, in a social setting, that has to be part of it for me okay. in the, in the city, in the case where it's just by myself, you know, am I okay or not? I might actually look at, well, have other people tell me if I'm okay or not. You know, that might be the case, but if I'm truly by myself, you know, I would think 
you know, I would, I would, I would sort of get it from breathing. Am I, you know, am I breathing properly? Am I sort of very, you know, sweaty, you know, stuff like this. So it, it would be a different, um, you know, that's perspective that I would look at it, that somehow I would know that I'm not okay because of these physical things that are happening. You know, maybe I'm, I've got pain or something, or maybe I'm, you know, I can't sleep. You know, these are things I could tell them on myself. And then there'd be other people to tell me that, you know, if I asked them, you mm -hmm. know, and whatever. But certainly in the in social setting, I think it would be interesting how people see that, that if in a social setting, if that was different for them, it's this okay question. I, I mean, I invite other people to sort of help me on that question. Well, so the 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 going to dinner is an interesting example then, because <clears throat> maybe a part of what we do is project project a set of expectations and then read the feedback accordingly, right? So, you know, if I'm going to dinner with a business acquaintance, then my expectation of how that would go well or not might be kind of limited. It's like, yeah, we had a, we had a good discussion and there weren't any problems. That was pretty good. That seemed to be okay. Um, you know, if I'm doing not badly on a given day, then I'm okay. But am I in a state where I feel compelled to, to need to do something different because I know I'm not going to feel very content this way for a very long time? That's a different set of expectations by which we gauge the feedback, right? So, Don? I was going to say, uh, the role of authority here, what you accept and what you accept, I suppose, blindly or unquestioningly, and what you accept, uh, but with a lot of qualifications, is a factor on okayness, I would say. I mean, have you heard the, the old joke about the two psychiatrists that met on the street? One said to the other, you're okay, how am I? That's it. <laughs> <clears throat> David? Uh, I just want to circle back to the white definitions because they're quite useful. Um, when you ask, how do you know that you're okay? You actually, it's not just you. It's actually a social thing. And so if you have enough people telling you that you're not okay, after a while, you begin to think, oh, I thought I was okay, but maybe I'm not. So yeah. uh, there's, a, there's a lot of identity and group issues. Um, it could be that one group says you're okay and the other group says you're not okay. And, and so one of the things I find about, about sense making and also true a lot with people that are working in systems is that we tend to orient the questions towards the psychological. We might also orient them towards the sociological. Um, and so when you say you're okay, it could be the plural you as a group. Well, and to, so to, you know, because Mike's work was organizationally based, you can take the same kind of question and simply ask, you know, as an organization, are we whatever? Are we being successful? Are we, you know, are, are we meeting our own expectations? Are, are we getting, you know, customer feedback in a way that tells us that we're being effective are you know our financial seats the gauge by which we're determining are we doing well or not you know each of these are different ways to to kind of use different points of feedback to make some determination about should we make a change or you know can we carry on as we are and you know we're good but each of those an organizational question is obviously a much more collective one by which you need to have some common sense of what that state is relative to any need to make a change. So, Peter? So, uh, what do we mean by okay? I, I, I resonate with what um, David suggests. I mean, it really, so is it a, a context of our personally feeling that we have a feedback that we know that we're, you know, as an individual, that I'm, um, that I'm healthy, that, I mean, I may not necessarily be flourishing. So what's my definition for okayness? Is it that I'm progressively doing well or doing better, which might be, again, effectiveness 
or just okay, or just normal. And normal is fine. When I hear okay, my definition of, you know, am I okay, is very similar to what I would use uh, with respect to like uh, medically normal. Like mm -hmm. am I? Um, and everybody's normal is different, but you, but we have a complex feedback system that knows when we're feeling, you know, normal in our bodies or not. It isn't necessarily optimal health for all people, but but normal, you know, when we're done with a period of being sick, we know when we feel normal. A doctor knows when, can kind of tell you too physically when you're normal. Psychologically, I think there's it's psychological states can be more dynamic than that. But there's a, uh, and I would go to the other side of uh, of also that you know that Dan and and. Uh, David have also suggested that, that there is what is the feedback for us, you know, for for feeling that I'm individually, uh, psychologically, you know, normal, not like effective at work or anything. That actually might be a different question. But I'd say it's it's just really in relationship. And so having having a close or consistent enough relationships, and you know, you know, it's human beings of in the Western society have only lived away from their extended families. That is as, as individuals that mature leave their families very often for maybe a century. I mean, we're agrarian societies. We didn't leave forever, you know, and now, you know, keep, families are estranged and people are, you know, have very different relationships, but it, you know, I would say that for thousands of years, our families are the ones that, reflected on what being okay was in the first ones that would people that would tell you um you know that that there might have been something off in your sense of yourself as as sensed in the family dynamic but in our personal relationships i think that that's you know so if you're you know i'm i'm married so i have somebody in i'm in relationship with in a committed relationship that i have that kind of feedback with and so you know we check in with each other and I think I trust that more than I would almost, you know, others. So it'd be very rare that somebody would, you know, I must be looking pretty badly if somebody's going to say to me that, you know, there's something going on, what's off. Um, you know, I might be worried or something, but even then I'm a professor, I can get away with that. <laughs> but I oh, think the relationship is important. Yes. Yeah. So maybe the question under the question is, you know, what is your process of self-assessment? Maybe that's what this is getting at, because you've just named a whole lot of possible ways for that to happen, Peter, as you know, other people have as well. So I'm going to move to, and this may be the, the last slide. This one um, I pulled up from an article I just happened to run across by, a, I think there's a woman named Jameson uh, in The New Yorker. It, it's just in the last few days. The, the article is why everyone feels like they're faking it. And here's the quotation. So this person, Land, um, Land's observation helped me realize that the imposter phenomenon, and this is the, the real um, focus of the article, this, um, it was actually a woman, <clears throat> the original author of this um, was a woman, I think her nickname was Tiny. She's like in her 80s now. She had lived through this lifelong experience of doing as well as she could to accomplish everything she possibly could only to always feel like somehow she was still undeserving and still basically faking through all the accomplishments, even as, as significant as they were. So she ended up being a PhD psychologist who, you know, went into gestalt therapy, found all kinds of ways to keep questioning this and continued to find that there were, in this case of this article, there were lots and lots of other successful professional women, particularly, who continued to find that they fell into this, this pattern. So our observations helped me realize that the imposter phenomenon as a concept effectually, effectively functions as an emotional filing cabinet organizing a variety of fraught feelings that we can experience as we try to reconcile three aspects of our personhood. How we experience ourselves, how we present ourselves to the world, 
and how the world reflects that self back to us. That's the essence of sense making in a very practical way. It is that iterative process. How do we know? Dan? Yeah, I'm going to sort of sh share something that's obviously very personal to me, but it's, it's troubled me for some time now. And that is that, you know, we, as we go through our life cycle, okay, and then our parents go through the life cycle, mm -hmm. the, the relationship necessarily changes. And I'll give you a simple sort of um, example here. I think, um, you know, earlier there, you know, when we're younger, I'll say, I'll argue that the way we think might be a little different than as we get older. And I'll use the example of my own sort of family or whatever. And that is that, you know, obviously over the course of time, you know, mental processes can deteriorate. And in the case of my family, some of the people in my family, that's exactly done that. And so I talked to my doctor, he said, oh yes, that's just natural. You know, you, that you, you're born, your parents are born as children. They become adults, take care of you. And then when they get older, they regress to being children again. And this is a very, this makes sense to me because, you know, some family members are saying some really silly things now. Now, the, and that's not the point, you know, and I think maybe Anna's experiencing, Anna Checkman and the other lady on the call was experiencing some of this is that, you know, perhaps there's a reversion back to some behaviors that would, you know, one might think are children. But the thing is though, and this is back to the expectation, I think you sort of alluded to earlier, Gary, that, you know, can we expect them to have full functionality, you know, to be fully, whatever you want to call it, functional or rational at this point? And I, I'm sensing more in now that it's not reasonable to expect that. And yet, you know, as, as now being a caregiver to my parents, so to speak, or, or anyone else who's older than I am in the, in the family, that it's it's become a, quote, a problem. And it, it's a very, it's, a, it's an interesting dynamic. And I'd be interested in hearing, you know, if people felt comfortable sharing their thoughts around that, what their own experiences have, of that has been, because it's obviously very troubling for me because the way I viewed my, say my parents is different than they, you know, than I viewed them before, because I thought before they were more whatever together, and now they're not. So I'd be happy to hear what people say, but don't feel compelled to do that because obviously it's a very personal matter. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Zad? Yeah, um, I have a lot of thoughts about imposter phenomenon and and Dan, maybe I'll address a little bit of, of your question, but I have a, almost a, I'm going to join two quotes together, um, Gary, which is one is, you know, perhaps this imposter phenomenon is the way that we sense make and, or the results of how we sense make in the modern, in the in modernity, in the modern world and in that construct. So in that way, it's like um, we sense our world and the world senses us back. And so the resulting effect of imposter syndrome, in my opinion, down to like plain slang, plain language slang is like people take themselves way too seriously. And there's a, there's a bizarre importance placed on human ability these days and what your, what one's power is and what they have control over. And the imposter phenomenon, in my opinion, is a result of people coming to terms with just how insignificant Sorry, no offense on the on the call here, but it's actually an energizing force. How insignificant you actually are. Not insignificant to certain units or contexts, but in that larger phenomenon in a, in a globally connected world and all those elements. And so um, I think that this loop, how we experience ourselves, how we present ourselves, how the world reflects that self back to us is a loop inside the loop of sense-making is a phenomenon of the time and it tells you what you are at that time. So it's telling society there's you're taking yourselves too seriously and you are not in control. And that's the resulting collective phenomenon coming out. That's the, the Zad theory. Thanks, Zad. And so I think, you know, bound up in all of this, I mean, it's so just focusing on this whole sense of being an imposter for a minute, it seems implicit that to feel that way, there must be someone else's sense of expectations more than our own that we're using to determine that whatever it is, that okayness, 
if you will, right? So I project myself into a world knowing that I'm probably really not that because whatever that is, that world's expectations are not something I think I meet, but it's something I need to pretend to meet so that other people see me that way and feedback that I'm okay as that, even though I don't think I am. It's a very, you know, it, it's a convoluted kind of loop, but it's not at all unusual. So Don? <clears throat> Yes, I, I was entirely agree with you, uh, first of all, because I think that this uh, particular phenomenon is not unusual. And um, I think it's especially the case when there's a lot of change from generation to generation in expectations. And um, you, uh, people are what they are, and they there's a, an expectation that they continue being what they are, or people get confused or even worse. So they keep at it, even though they don't believe in it. So now they're imposters in that direction. But they are also having trouble changing over to new expectations or new models. And then they feel like they're an imposter in that direction. So they feel increasingly squeezed. And I think also um, there are stereotypes, right? And unfortunately, one of them is towards people who are older, who are assumed to be more like children which is an appalling stereotype. Occasionally it's true, but then again, they may have been like children all their lives, but nobody noticed. <laughs> That's basically it. I mean, it, it, we have to be aware of the larger context and how things are shifting. Yeah. So I'm going to, so where we are with time, <clears throat> I'm going to move to, and this is the last slide. And this is one where, I'm intrigued by this, what a strong motivator this is, this whole idea of cognitive dissonance. And mm -hmm. so the idea that somehow I do not meet a set of expectations that I believe I should <clears throat> is one, one <laughs> form, right? But another form of cognitive dissonance is, dissonance is simply... I can't reconcile the things that I am perceiving with what I believe I my what I believe myself to know, either about myself or about some other situation. Hmm. <clears throat> the you know this whole idea in the U.S. particularly of the kind of absolute nonsense that people can stand up and proclaim as if other people are to believe that it's true because it reinforces the beliefs that some people think they need to hold. So for some people, they can create enough of a cognitive feedback loop to say, yes, this must be true because it resolves my cognitive dissonance. So, you know, I... I cannot fathom the fact that I would live in a country where people who aren't like me now seem to be in control. Hmm. And I have to reconcile that. And so I am willing to accept an awful lot of things that I might not otherwise have believed were true in order to reconcile those things in myself. But it's a whole different level. When you, so I've, I've had multiple discussions over the last six months, year or so, with my youngest nephew, who just turned 18. And he was explaining to me the kind of a, a kid's experience of social media coming up. So he was only entering high school when the pandemic happened. Kids were thrown completely out of whack. You know, they were home, they were homeschooling, they had their social connections were completely taken apart. 
you know, he was at an age where just starting to use social media to make those kind of contacts was not so familiar. And so what happened was it was a, a an absolute total immersion for a couple of years for his particular cohort to start using Instagram and Snapchat particularly. And that's not universal across every place in the world, but those just happened to be the ones that his group were using. And what he said was they're, they're two very different kinds of places to exist for the friends. With Instagram, there was an incredible pressure to, to present the most perfect photoshopped images of themselves in order to meet some other criteria about what was okay. And they would spend hours and hours perfecting those images to try to project themselves in a way that was acceptable. And Snapchat was a very different medium. There, there was not that, it was much more instantaneous, but the pressure within that social media platform was that you could not disengage because if you did not participate, if you did not react fast enough, then you were assumed somehow to be maybe, you know, disrespecting other people or ghosting them if you just went off and you weren't continuing to be involved. And so it became such a compulsion that, you know, you couldn't really leave if somebody else kept the whole thing going. So they were up all hours of nights keeping on because they perceived that they couldn't not. And so the pressure to become a part of this and to project themselves and to perform in ways that then gave them at least a level of acceptable approval was completely overwhelming. And now we see, you know, teenage kids having the probably the worst level of mental health issues that we've seen in a generation at least. So this idea that somehow at a bigger level, there is this, this thought that we have a compulsion to try to be, to act in ways that are acceptable in order to be okay or to be successful or to be whatever that is that we need to be. I think social media has cr not created that, but it has so completely changed the types of, of feedback that a lot of people use or get, that it truly has created a different kind of phenomenon. You know, if I have to create myself as a persona on TikTok, it dramatically changes the way that I perceive myself as being a person acting in the world. That has to do with the technology, but it also has to do with just the visibility. So Mark, you had a hand up a second ago. Yeah, my phone has thought I've been in a car and I don't know how to manage a phone that is sitting in my house that um, thinks I'm in a car. But um, at any rate, I got, at least got to where I could be. This has been a very interesting conversation and Carl Weick is a, uh, I love Carl Weick um, and, and by extension that people might not agree with David Snowden. But uh, what I wanted to share was the comments of the last 15 minutes about, um, well, where it led me was how is it that a human being can feel grounded um, under conditions of uh, stress and anxiety? And, and to me, that's the basis of sense-making. And Carl wrote this incredible paper I'll, I'll screw up the title, uh, but basically uh, ambivalence as the optimum form of wisdom, which just blew my mind. And I talked to him about it and actually created a little diagram of it. But what he basically said is the real gig here is to not fall into either of the low energy states of knowing or, or not knowing and to stay at the, 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 the energy, the, the, the state that requires actually cognitive and emotional energy that is ambivalence, not knowing. And then, because he's trying to get to wisdom, and mm -hmm. I'm a chemist, so you know, I created an energy of activation kind of diagram. And then you can jump to wisdom under T 
two simultaneous conditions, um, experience and um, uh, uh, what do you call it when you, uh, you're on stage and you're, what's that word? Um, you know, where people, uh, where you what? take a leap. Improvisation? Um, improv, improv, improvisation. Okay. So it's experience and improv, but only there from ambivalence can you get there. And so that was one thought going through my mind. And then when you were, I realized, I've been realizing for the last two or three months, my mother died a couple of years ago, and I realized how much I owe her. Because without ever speaking about it, she made me understand that I belong on this planet, that it's perfectly fine for me to be here. And my kids don't have that, okay? And most people I see today don't have that. They actually question uh, at some deep level, some embodied level, they, they question their own belonging. And that's a really awful place to be because you have to keep convincing yourself that you belong here. And boy, that's a lot of effort. Um, and so I just, well, I just wanted to sort of publicly speak for mothers who I'm not sure that fathers can actually play that role. Maybe they can, but mothers certainly can. And, uh, and, and for all the things I've been through, uh, you know, I am an ER doc, so I'm pretty good, you know, fly airplanes and do all kinds of crazy stuff. I'm pretty good um, in those kind of situations. And I think actually my mother gets 100% of the credit. How can you enjoy ambivalence? How can you enjoy not knowing? Because life is only not knowing. I think we, if you think you know something, you're so, you're so wrong. <laughs> I know you're wrong. <laughs> There's some irony. Anyway, that's all I had to say, but I really enjoyed listening and the, and the comments. Thanks Thank for, uh, Elena invited me. That's how I'm here. Good. Well, and so I, congratulations to your mother. She gets a lot of credit. And by the way, you've embodied it and that's why it's still there. That's how that happens. So I think I've said enough. Um, we've, I guess we're almost at the end of um, two hours. David, Zad, I will let you guys decide how to, um, how to wrap this up. Okay. Um, so yes, we're, we're at the end. Um, I'd like to thank Gary for leading this discussion. Um, he, he reminds me that before he was teaching organizational systems, he was in family therapy. So uh, you, you get a sense for what it's like to be in a family therapy session with Gary. I think we just experienced that. Uh, for the uh, next month, um, I, we actually have a, uh, we've had a long-term scheduling for an event for next month. Uh, and I'm trying to confirm that it's going to happen. Um, I'm not receiving responses back. So um in a couple of weeks, you'll get a uh, message about that topic or another topic that I have sitting uh, in my back pocket. So we'll see everyone next month. Thank you all. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Gary. Good to see you. Thanks, yes, Gary. Thank you. David.